You're listening to Thought Huddle. I'm your host, Mary Charlotte Domondi. This is a podcast produced by Arizona State University in which we explore ideas, tell stories, and try to make sense of our complex world. If you've ever worried about what goes into your beauty products, your packaging, even your food, you've got good reason to. Because a lot of those chemicals are staying around for a long time after we use them, and a lot of them are not good for you, your family, and for many of the creatures with whom we coexist on this planet. Rolf Halden has for decades been studying the chemicals used in everything from hair products to food containers, and what he found is alarming. The toxins from antibacterial products, pharmaceuticals, personal care products, plastics, pesticides, and more all have potential health impacts, including adverse birth outcomes, hormone disruption, and increased risk of cancer, to name a few. And his studies show that the lifespan of these chemicals is getting longer. Rolf Halden is director of the Center for Environmental Health Engineering at the Biodesign Institute at Arizona State University, where he's also a senior sustainability scientist in the Global Institute of Sustainability. Today, his Human Health Observatory at ASU has established hundreds of monitoring systems in cities across the nation to measure what he calls urban metabolism. With degrees in civil and environmental engineering and biology, he knows how to figure out where hazardous chemicals come from, where they go, what their impact is on health, and how to remove them from contaminated water, both surface water and groundwater, and agricultural soil. How does Halden get his information? Well, by studying sewage. Yep, that's right. What we flush, what goes down the drain, those things tell us a great deal and tell us fast about what chemicals are persisting in our environment and their possible impact on the health of people and planet. I talked to Ralph Halden about many of these issues, and we started with the whole question of why study sewage. Welcome, Ralph Halden, to Thought Huddle. Thanks for having me. How did you come to start studying sewage? So we are interested in the health of populations and in how we are conducting ourselves in cities. Uh, cities are the, the centers of uh, resource consumption and also where most people live. And so we would like to find out uh, whether people are healthy and what they're doing to themselves and to the environment. And it turns out that wastewater, that is essentially all the water that collects from the water, the shower water, the wash water, and the, the urine stool and, and feces that uh, are washed away in the, in the bathrooms, is combined and uh, runs to the wastewater treatment plants, the uh, central facilities in cities in the developed world. And it turns out that uh, the information, the chemical and biological information that is contained in the wastewater, as ugly as it sounds, is actually very informative and can tell us what people are doing in the city, how many people are there, what the health issues are, what types of chemicals they get exposed to, and what types of bacteria might lurk in the city that endanger the health of the people. And one of the things that's so interesting about wastewater is that it tells no lies, so it's much more accurate than other ways of getting data. That's right. We say the the sewage doesn't lie. When we get confronted with uh, delicate questions as to our lifestyle, we often give the answer of uh, how we like to conduct us rather than how we actually behave. And so right. this is true for the consumption of alcohol, of uh, nicotine, uh, drug use, uh, medication overuse, and so forth. And it turns out that if you turn to urine and feces, then you get a chemical signal of what actually happens rather than a uh, make-believe answer from someone. This is all really great data for public health. To what extent are our illnesses caused by environmental factors? Do we know? Yeah, that's an excellent question. We believe that almost half of the adverse health outcomes that we experience are somehow related to the environment. And the environment is a big term. Actually, there's a term called environmental health, and it's not the health of the environment. It's actually the impact of the environment on human health. It's a very important field. It's uh, underappreciated and, in my eyes, underfunded right now. But it really drives the, the health outcomes in populations. And so it turns out that if, as we zero in on wastewater, we can learn a lot about what happens and how the environment is structured in cities and what we do to ourselves that ultimately is not good for our health. When you say that something like half of our illnesses have these kinds of environmental causes, what illnesses are we talking about? 
Well, I think if illnesses that come to mind, maybe in the, by the listeners, is exposure to pathogens, right, bacteria that make us sick. Uh, think of the flu, maybe a virus or uh, drug-resistant bacteria that can turn a small injury into a life-threatening disease. And, and also diseases like cancer. We do know that uh, chemicals play a big role in causing cancer, being an agent that essentially initiates the disease. So there's a large number of diseases, including diseases that are becoming more and more important, like Alzheimer's disease and um, even Parkinson's disease. There's a, a huge array of adverse health outcomes that we know have some link to environmental health. In your work, you look at the entire system, not only people who live in cities whose waste you're studying, but also the places where their waste goes, rivers and oceans, land, and then all the plants and animals that inhabit them. And you take this public health approach to the whole kind of like ecosystem in which people live. Talk about that approach, looking at the larger system as opposed to the medical approach that looks at how to cure people when they get sick. That's right. People are familiar with the concept of the patient and the doctor. Uh, we don't do this. We turn engineers into the doctors that treat and take care of the health of a city. So as we look at a city as one large organism, we have to appreciate that we dictate the chemical and biological safety in the city by the types of things that we bring into the city. This is the food, this is the, you know, the, the products, the transportation that we use, that all forms an environment that has an impact on health. So we can characterize that. We are never interested in an individual. So when we measure something, whether it's um, a toxic chemical or a drug uh, of abuse, we never know who takes it. But uh, we do know that on average there is a population that get exposed to certain types of biological and chemical agents that are known to cause disease. It's interesting when we look at wastewater treatment plants. People may not know that uh, a lot of the cleaning of wastewater, meaning turning contaminated sewage into raw drinking water is done by microorganisms. So this is called biological treatment or activated sludge treatment in wastewater treatment plants across the United States and has been conducted since the 1970s with the introduction of the Clean Water Act. So microorganisms are the key helper in making our water clean. Now you appreciate that if you create chemicals that kill bacteria or that are not uh, consumable by bacteria, then you create a chemistry that has no place to go and essentially uh, we create chemical nomads that migrate through the environment and can accumulate in people and cause harm. And so we use wastewater treatment plants as a microcosm, as a little, little mini world where we can see the behavior of chemicals and can forecast whether a chemical will degrade and whether it will accumulate in living things like fish, in our food, or in ourselves, in our body. There's a deep irony there, which is that chemicals that we use because we think that they're making us cleaner and safer actually in some ways have the opposite effect by killing those microorganisms that are nature's sort of little, little cleaners. That's right. So actually one of our first discoveries was an antimicrobial or antibacterial agent that is designed to kill harmful microorganisms, pathogens. The chemical is called triclocarban, and it has a chemical twin uh, by the name of triclosan that people might have heard before in advertisements. And so we discovered that there was no information of what happens to these antimicrobial agents once they get used to soaps and uh, get washed into the wastewater and then arrive at a wastewater treatment plant. So we took back in 2002, we took our first samples at a municipal wastewater treatment plant looking for these antimicrobials. And we're wondering if you design a chemical that is supposed to kill bacteria, what happens to it during biological treatment of wastewater that is supposed to create raw drinking water? And it's not surprising that we, we found the chemical because we used it by the millions of pounds per year in the United States. But it entered the wastewater treatment plant and turned out to not be degraded by the microorganisms. And instead of degrading, three out of four molecules persisted during the treatment and accumulated in a material known as sewage sludge. So this is the unwanted byproduct of biological wastewater treatment. All the things that don't degrade are accumulating in sewage sludge. <laughs> 
This material then returns into the environment, often is applied on land, creating a pathway for toxic chemicals to make a full loop and uh, re-enter the environment, possibly contaminating the food supply and coming right back to us. Now, this sewage sludge, when you say it's used on agricultural land, is it presented as fertilizer? I think it's very important to appreciate that we are right now engaged in what is known as the linear economy. We extract resources from the earth, we make the products we desire and need, and then uh, we dispose of them. But if you look to nature, you will see that there is always a closed loop. Everything that is being produced, every output of one process becomes an input to another process. So in principle, it's a very good idea to always have a plan for the end-of-life product, you know, that we have or for any output of a behavior and activity. Now, unfortunately, with the sewage sludge, which contains a lot of useful things like nitrogen and phosphorus that are essential for growing crops and feeding the world, they also contain these toxic chemicals, which are poorly designed and therefore don't degrade and become a toxic legacy that moves through the environment into water, soil, air. Uh, Long-range transport has brought these chemicals all the way to the polar caps, contaminating polar bears. You know, the fat tissue of polar bears is one of the most highly contaminated materials on Earth with respect to chlorinated, fluorinated, and brominated resistant, persistent chemistry. Now, Talk for a moment about triclosan, triclocarbon. These are chemicals that were sold, they're banned now, and we'll get to that in a moment, but they were sold as antibacterial, antimicrobial. They're also really toxic. What is the nature of their toxicity? Like, what do they do to humans, to infants, to children? What do they do to fish and to other aquatic life? Yeah, in the, at the beginning of the 19th century, we discovered that we can take natural chemicals and pull off the hydrogens and replace them with chlorine atoms and create carbon-chlorine bonds. That completely changes the way the chemical behaves. First, we love these chemicals and we, we mass-produce them to make transformer fluids, to make pesticides like DDT. But on closer inspection, we found that these chemicals are extremely harmful to a lot of other things than just the purposes you know, for which we apply them. For example, a pesticide is good at killing the uh, malaria-carrying vector mosquitoes, but it also kills a lot of other animals and insects. And so we learned that it's an indiscriminate chemistry that is essentially causing a lot of collateral damage. And we have moved away from this chemistry for the most part. But there's some hanger-ons, and triclosan and triclocarbon represent, you know, leftover kind of members of this larger group of chemicals that mostly has been banned in the 1970s. Think of DDT or the transformer fluids, the PCBs, polychlorinated biphenyls. This chemistry was banned back then. It is still present in a lot of our bodies, and we routinely detect these chemicals because they will persist on for decades and sometimes centuries. But it's important to get our arms around that and to not create this legacy of pollution. So we discovered triclocarbon in 2002 at the wastewater treatment plant as a persistent chemical and then tracked it through the environment, and we found it just about everywhere we looked. We found it in surface waters. We found it in fish. We found it in babies at birth. We found it in the mother. We found triclosan in mother's milk. The chemicals just have a way of moving through the environment and get to places where we don't want them. And we brought this information to the regulatory agencies, the Food and Drug Administration of the United States, and ultimately these chemicals were banned. And The ban was announced in 2016 and became effective in 2017. And so what we hope to see in the current monitoring program that we're conducting across the United States and around the world is to see the levels of triclosan, triclocarban, and other antimicrobials to now recede and become lower and ultimately undetectable in the environment as well as in people. What is the harm that they do? A lot of these chemicals have a function that is known as endocrine disruption. So they act like hormone. The best way to explain this is like think of a cell phone conversation where the connection isn't that great and some words are missing or pieces of words are missing. And so it can completely change the message that is being delivered. So the signaling compounds, the signaling chemistry in the body is being changed. And that has profound impacts on human health. For example, on the development of the human body. 
And so we see, for example, intersex fish as a result of exposure to endocrine disrupting chemicals. Similarly, we make observations of premature birth of other disformation or malformation of sexual reproductive organs that we see in people where we don't have an explanation, but we see that these outcomes are correlated with a higher body burden, a higher exposure to these chemicals. When you look at these chemicals, are they affecting other life downstream, wildlife, drinking water, things like that? Yeah, so only because the chemical has served the purpose for which it was synthesized doesn't mean that its life and impact is over. If a chemical is what we call biologically active, then this will carry forward until the chemical is being destroyed. And if chemicals don't get destroyed in the wastewater treatment plant, then they will have their endocrine disrupting effects also downstream in the rivers where the wastewater treatment plants discharge to. The rivers go into estuaries and then into the ocean. And um, we see the contamination from major cities travel all the way into the oceans. And we have even measured the antimicrobials in fish species in the open sea as well as in dolphins. Antimicrobials that are used in personal care products, they actually are detectable in dolphins. So we use so much of these chemicals that they essentially are polluting not only the immediate water environment in the city, but also the larger water environment uh, that covers our planet. And they begin to contaminate just about every organism that lives in that environment. Let's take a moment to take this all in. Howland and his group identified these toxic chemicals in 2002, but they were not off the shelves until 2017. Imagine if you had a rattlesnake nest on a public school playground, and it took 14 years for the authorities to agree that it probably wasn't so good for the children, and another year to remove the nest. During the decade and a half that it took to ban triclosan and triclocarban, mothers were inadvertently feeding these toxins to their babies through their own milk, and it took its effect on those children and on fish, crustaceans, and many other life forms. I asked Rolf Halden about his vision for a better way of dealing with dangerous chemicals in our water and food. I think it's, it's very frustrating for a health professional to see the delay in recognizing a risk that is imparted on a large fraction of the population and then seeing inaction for a long period of time. And I think personally this is unacceptable and we're working in our center for environmental health engineering to change that by having essentially near real-time monitoring of chemical and biological threats and communicating this information right away to the stakeholders. Legislation obviously takes a long time, right, and policy decisions of that nature that come by a court order. But there's a much more expeditious way of making public health decisions by communicating it to, for example, mayors who have much more flexibility to allow or cut the, the flow of toxic chemicals into the city or from plants that are within the city limits. And so there are ways of getting the word out more quickly and reaching decision makers so that we hopefully don't have to wait 14 years in the future. We also feel that the detection of chemical behavior at the wastewater treatment plants gives us kind of a leg up in decision making because if we see a chemical enter a wastewater treatment plant and exit it without being destroyed, a red flag goes up and we know that this is not a what we call sustainable chemical, ultimately the chemistry that we want to produce. We want to make chemicals that are benign by design, that serve a purpose, and that have a very short afterlife. We are not there yet, and uh, we pay the price. One large challenge is that we, in a way, subsidize the production of harmful chemicals. We don't pay the true cost when we pick up um, antimicrobial personal care products. The true cost shows in the health profile of the population and in the degradation of the environment and the, the cost for remediation of the environment and the health care costs that we incur. And so what needs to happen is that we bring the responsibility of paying for these types of damages back to the makers of the chemicals. Ultimately, it is not in the interest of industry to pollute the consumer and to shorten their lifespan because uh, then they have less time to buy their products. So it is a matter of becoming smart with respect to chemical design and then bringing everyone to the table, including chemical industry, which is not the enemy, which is actually the provider of most of the consumer products that we have, and make decisions that protect everyone, that protects industry from liability and protect consumers from toxic chemicals.
It's a real paradigm shift where companies would be responsible not for just maximizing their profit by making products that people want to buy, but by looking at the whole life cycle of the product and the social impact of that product and taking responsibility for it. I mean, that's not going to happen tomorrow because it's counter to our mindset, but it's an awfully good idea. There's certain ways how we subsidize products that are not smart. If you think of, for example, plastics, plastics are made from petroleum. Petroleum and the fossil fuel industry is heavily subsidized around the world, and we don't tax it in a way that we should in order to make up for the costs and the, the damage that incurs during the extraction of these resources. If we would, then the material would be more expensive. And then other materials like biofuels and fuels that are based on renewable resources would be much more cost attractive. So right now, the, the system is biased against the smart, green and sustainable chemistry and uh, favors the old timer chemistry that has harmed us and will continue to harm us for generations if we don't turn the corner. You know, another irony of this triclosan antibacterial hand soap is that it wasn't even effective as an antibacterial soap. Talk about that and talk about what we really are doing when we're washing our hands. Yeah, there's a, there's a great irony, actually, maybe two. The consumers, they bought into the belief that they have to wipe out every last microbe that resides on their body, which is not a good concept to have. But also they were believing that these chemicals are very effective. Now, it turns out that these chemicals do kill bacteria, but they need a certain contact time. So the chemical has to reside on the microbe for a long enough time for the chemical to make a difference. On average, uh, the consumer washes his or her hands for about six seconds. That's not long enough for the chemical to do much. So the chemicals, for the most part, are just added to a product and without providing any benefit, were washed down with the wastewater and then arrived at the wastewater treatment plant to create a long string of pollution and unwanted outcomes, including endocrine disruption. So this was the one irony. Uh, the, the second one is that they also cause actually greater microbial risks. Now, it turns out that when microbes get repeatedly exposed to these endomicrobials, they toughen up, they become resistant to this chemical assault. And in the process, they not only are becoming resistant to the antimicrobial itself, but also to antibiotics that your doctor might prescribe to save your limbs or life if you have a microbial infection. And so we have observed in the laboratory that bacteria exposed to things like triclosan can become cross-resistant to over half a dozen antibiotics that are used in human medicine. And this is of great concern because, as we all know, antibiotics are life-saving chemicals. If they don't work anymore, we essentially are doomed to go back to uh, middle evil times where people died oftentimes from just simple injuries that uh, resulted in combination of the wound and then an incurable microbial infection. Now, the United States and Europe have different systems for evaluating chemicals. The European system is more precautionary. They'd rather keep something off the shelf until it's proven safe, while we kind of tend to keep it on the shelf until it's proven toxic. Can you correlate the difference in these approaches to the difference in our public health outcomes? So that's right. Uh, in Europe, there's the thinking of the precautionary principle. If you think something could be really bad, but you don't have all the data yet, the thinking is then let's not use this chemical, let's use something else that's safe and we avoid that risk. In America and in a, a number of other countries, the case is that you have to prove that a chemical is really bad, otherwise you're free to produce it. One of our ambitions is to measure these types of differences in health outcomes based on differences in the toxics that are in our body and in our environment and correlate it then to the different health attributes and health statuses of populations. And we do know that, for example, in Europe, the use of antibiotics in uh, the food production industry had been curtailed by laws. And if you don't feed chickens and pigs antibiotics, then you come up with uh, meat that contains less antibiotics and or no antibiotics and also no bacteria that are drug resistant. And so we have seen the benefits in Europe from removing antibiotics. And we are just beginning in the United States to remove antibiotics from routine use for increasing the yield of meat production. This also applies to aquaculture, by the way, to the production of fish for mass consumption. 
Another, I guess, version of the same question is when you're looking at an American city and you are studying the data that you get from the wastewater, from their wastewater treatment plant, if you have that data and then you have public health data for that city, do they match up? Can you correlate them when you compare it to a different city? This is an excellent and important question. We are, we are trying to answer this right now. In how far can we anticipate diseases in cities and make changes to the environment so that we prevent the outbreaks of epidemics, whether they are biological or of chemical nature? We feel that there's a great opportunity, and we have established a network of over 200 cities across the United States where we have collected either wastewater or municipal sewage sludge or both to understand what the exposure and the health status is of the people living in this area. So in essence, we have information on about 32 million Americans, and we have information that also has been archived, and so we can go back in time and find out how the chemical exposure has changed between, let's say, 2001 and 2018. If you align this information with the available health information that is provided by health care providers and so forth, then you can discern the impact of the environment on human health. It is no surprise that in cities that historically were part of uh, maybe the, the rust belt or the production of steel, that concentrations of heavy metals are higher. We know that a uh, number of heavy metals are harmful to, to humans. Think of lead or chromium. And so we are trying to identify these toxic agents in the environment, see whether people get exposed and, uh, and hopefully can convince the decision makers to remove these exposure sources to keep everybody healthy and safe. Halden began his career working on the back end, so to speak, cleaning up contamination sites around the nation. But as he progressed in his work, he was drawn toward academia, working with policymakers and creating legislation. Rather than cleaning it up, he wanted to stop the flow of harmful chemicals at their source. He compared it to having a flood in your house. First you fix the leaking pipe, then you clean up. Chemical contamination in cities works the same way. It was becoming clear that examining sewage could not only identify toxic chemicals like the antimicrobials, but it could also be used to observe what people chose to put in their own bodies, like drugs and alcohol. The Human Health Observatory monitors the results coming in from more than 300 sites in cities around the world, and it tells us what people there are actually doing. I asked Halden what kind of pharmaceuticals, drugs, legal and illegal, he was finding, and how that information could be useful, especially in places where there are drug problems. One example is the issue of opioid abuse in North America and specifically in the USA. So we do know that we can detect drugs in urine, right? And so if that is true, then obviously we can also detect these drugs in wastewater. And so we've learned that we can analyze what we call composite samples, so 24-hour samples of uh, the wastewater that flows in the city, and determine fairly accurately all the different types of drugs that are being used in the city, as well as drug use trends. This is very important information for people who want to combat the opioid abuse crisis that we have in the United States right now. And we have demonstrated with our data that we can measure in almost near real time the consumption of different drugs, opioids, as well as other prescription and illicit drugs in cities. Having this information helps the decision makers to judge whether any of the interventions that they implement in their cities actually are beneficial. And a very important way of influencing health is education. And educational interventions take place in school and through advertisements and so forth. But it's difficult to judge the impact of that. We do feel we have scientific studies saying that, yeah, it will probably work. But it's so much nicer that if you spend money on education or on advertisements that you actually see a direct correlation in the chemistry of the wastewater of the city. If we succeed there, then we get much better in getting a good return on investment. So for every dollar we spend on public health issues, we get tangible results back. That's that's our dream, and that's what we call the, the public health approach for the future. Just as you look at opioids and all kinds of other drugs, you also can look at things like alcohol. There's also smoking, one of our greatest killers. There's also obesity, and there are questions of diet. All of these things 
can be studied. What are you looking at? What are you seeing? That's right. So these techniques, the art, so to speak, of measuring any type of chemical in wastewater really opens up a spectrum of applications and of ways of improving public health. It doesn't only apply to opioids. We can measure just about any chemical. And as you stated, we can also measure alcohol consumption and nicotine consumption, so smoking and drinking. And we not only measure the chemical itself, but we measure what's known as the metabolite. So it's the the altered chemistry that the body creates. It creates a unique signature where we know that the chemical has migrated through the human body. And so we can measure these metabolites of chemicals and know that they have exposed people before and can determine how much alcohol has on average been consumed in a 24-hour period or a week or a month in a given city. That is useful information to have. It, again, gets to information that is difficult to collect if you use traditional means of questionnaires, interviews, where you oftentimes have a bias and you don't get inaccurate or sometimes completely wrong information. Let's go back to the question and the problem of plastics, which make up an inconceivably huge amount of waste, both in landfills and in the ocean, in rivers. Much of it single-use plastic, like plastic bottles and a lot of plastic medical products and so on. Describe to us the scope of the problem and how you are thinking about changing it, dealing with it, creating alternatives. Yeah, so again, we are right now in the process of producing a lot of chemistry that has no place to go and will be with us for generations, sometimes for millennia. And plastics are one type of chemical that is also obeying this process. And the reason for that is, again, because we don't design the chemicals smarter in the first place. So we are quickly approaching the time where we will have more plastic debris in the ocean than we have fish in there by mass. That's frightening. And the plastics will linger there for millennia. So it's very important that we cut off the inputs of plastics into the ocean. That begins with consumers really questioning themselves. Do I need this plastic product? Can I use something else? So it's very easy to avoid, for example, the use of bottled water. It's uh, overpriced and it's not good for the environment. Sometimes even bottled water has greater health risks. So there's an opportunity on the consumer side to reduce the amount of plastics that are being used or also asking when they purchase products to kind of force the the provider to provide alternatives that are smarter. We do have biodegradable plastics. There are smarter polymers out there. They are just not being used right now. I think if enough people would ask for these products and would make sure that it's not just greenwashing, not just, you know, we add 1% biodegradable polymer to the fossil fuel-based plastics and then call them green, that's called greenwashing because it's not helpful. But if we actually create polymers that are made from renewable feedstocks, make these products then that also become biodegradable and are in sync with the natural degradation processes, then we can cut off the continuous flow of materials and accumulation of these materials in the environment and ultimately in our body. Now, biodegradable plastics are, as I understand it, made from plant material as opposed to being made from petroleum. These alternatives require agricultural land. Have you done the math on how much land we would need to produce the same amount of biodegradable plastic as the petroleum-based plastic that we're doing now? Is that is that like even feasible? So I think we all know about the mistake we made when we wanted to replace fossil fuels and turn to sugarcane and sugar beets and corn as the source of material that gives us ethanol. The problem with that is that we use up important agricultural land production area for food that is needed in order to feed the now, you know, uh, 7 billion people and going toward 10 billion people that we expect to populate the planet. And so we cannot rely on plants and we shouldn't look to agricultural land. It turns out that there are next generation ways of producing fuels and also plastics. So rather than going to plants, we actually can move to algae and then we can uh, also use bacteria, which are even smaller. And they are very good at producing oils and and other raw materials that that can be manipulated into the products and feedstocks that we want to produce, including the, the feedstocks for biodegradable polymers like plastic replacements.
What kinds of policy changes could encourage that shift or speed up that shift to, let's say, algae-based plastics? Well, first of all, I think we, we need to uh, stop subsidizing the non-renewable fuels uh, that we rely on today in both for the transportation sector as well as for the production of chemicals. We also could incentivize by providing incentives for industry to switch over to renewable resources. We have to understand that uh, it's always a little painful and expensive to move from one way of operating to another one. But ultimately, we will be much better off and we will be running more economically and ultimately can operate indefinitely if we work on renewable energy and material sources. And so if we look to the harvesting of sunshine, and the recycling of carbon dioxide, then we solve the problem of running out of fossil fuels as well as changing our atmosphere in unacceptable ways right now that uh, leads to outcomes like climate change, which uh, have obviously a huge price tag as we see with the rapidly increasing uh, natural disasters that we observe around the world. This work goes from local to state to national and even international. I mean, you start with data from municipal water systems. And then there's more and more data coming from many different cities and many different countries. What are the mechanisms, maybe they're evolving right now, by which this data can really lead to policy change, make a difference, be seen as a a kind of more global big picture? Mm -hmm. That's right. So we we started, as I mentioned earlier, in 2002 with monitoring at a single city in the United States. We then expanded to 200 cities in the United States to observe regional differences. And now our network is uh, spanning over 300 monitoring locations in cities around the world. We hope to create a network that is even bigger so that we have on every continent our observatories where we conduct sampling and uh, essentially put our finger on the chemical and biological policy of humanity and measure in near real time, delayed by maybe 24 to 72 hours, what it is that we're doing and um, how we do health-wise. If we are succeeding in creating what I call a dashboard of public health, then we can immediately read off any actions that we take, good ones or bad ones, and see the impact of that. So if we have interventions for, for example, to counter smoking, you know, we see the impact of that immediately reflected in the wastewater. We call this urban metabolism. We look at a city as one large organism, and uh, we like to keep the city healthy and with that the population residing in it. So urban metabolism, and what we do is we measure things, so we call it urban metabolism metrology. And I think it is a very important field that will ultimately help to inform the design of chemicals as well as the use of different substances and controlling activities and helping to understand how interventions that we implement around the world impact human behavior. As I was reading about your work and thinking about it, I was also looking at my life and realizing that I've gotten, I have gotten rid of plastic bottles by getting one of those soda fizzing things and don't buy any kind of carbonated water anymore. But I was looking at my laundry detergent bottles and that's liquid. And I realized that I could buy powdered laundry detergent in a box and that box is biodegradable. And there's a lot of things that we can do. I was wondering how your work, because you're immersed in it every day, how it has changed the way you yourself live, any personal decisions that you might be making that have changed over time? Well, I think certainly we have a a heightened awareness, you know, myself and then certainly my family and circle of friends and the scientists that work in our laboratory for the durability and persistence of materials and sometimes their almost stupid design that creates products that are not, not even necessary and creating a lot of problems down the road. So on the one hand, uh, having that information is good. What it What is needed is also to be able to look to alternatives. And oftentimes we don't have alternatives. You mentioned with the detergents, yes, it's if you buy a powder, then you buy a, a carton. But we just have to find a way of communicating our desire to have more sustainable products in our supermarkets and things that we bring home to ultimately arrive at a more sustainable and healthy lifestyle. It's a huge challenge, and we don't want to always think about these types of things, but you can't help it because (laughs) when you look at the shelves of supermarket, there's just a lot of stuff there that is either not needed or it's very poorly designed and doesn't make for a good shopping experience and a good health experience ultimately.
I don't buy bottled water. And uh, also understanding the, the footprint that we create. So, for example, I decided, looked at what is the biggest thing that I can personally do in order to improve the sustainability of our household. For example, I added a solar system on our house and uh, have a, a lot of avoidance in terms of negative carbon footprint. So it also saves, uh, saves money, so it's a, it's a win-win situation. Well, I want to send a big thanks to you for the work you do. And as you mentioned earlier, all the engineers that are working on this, as you say, we tend to think of public health as the purview of medical doctors and medical researchers. But here, as you've shown us, engineers are a huge part of our public health work. If people want to find out more about this, what can they do? Well, I'd like to thank you for bringing that up. Yes, engineers are kind of the secret heroes that keep society going and uh, they provide clean water and without getting benefits. We hear about medical miracles and, and doctors getting a lot of credit, rightly so. But uh, engineers, you know, they keep millions of people safe at a time rather than one patient at a time. And so it's a very rewarding profession. I encourage people to look into it if they uh, are yet to pick a discipline they want to work in. And it's also important to support the engineering discipline and recognize the importance of infrastructure, whether it's the water infrastructure or wastewater infrastructure or the energy infrastructure. These are just important investments for cities and the country to make that pay huge rewards for the population and its health overall. So I enjoy working in engineering, and I encourage other people to look into it. Rolf Halden, thank you so much for being with us. Thanks so much for the opportunity to speak. You've been listening to Thought Huddle. We're coming to you from Arizona State University. I'm your host, Mary Charlotte Domondi. You can find us on iTunes, on your podcast app, and at thoughthuddle.com. Thanks to Nikai Salcido and Zeli Pollan for production assistance on this podcast, and thanks to you for listening. Next time, we'll be talking about sustainable urban development with a focus on Phoenix, Arizona. Stay tuned, and we'll see you next time.